Welcome to From VFX to VR, How to Transition, presented by Cinefax, with Bernice Howes, VFX producer, stars, Ben Grossman, co-founder and CEO, Magnopus, Aruna Inversen, creative director and VFX supervisor, Digital Domain, Emily Cooper, producer and director, Hollor Media, and Sam Macaroni, director, Thundership. Woo! <laughs> Hi everyone, how are you guys doing? Are you having a fun time out there? Did you see a lot of stuff? Yeah. Yeah? It's amazing. The lines are long. I hope you guys got into stuff. Um, Emily couldn't be with us. She actually had to go on a VR shoot and she's on a plane early this morning, so she apologizes for not being here. We have an amazing panel. Um, a little bit about myself. I wanted to. My name is Bernice Howes. I'm a visual effects and VR producer, and I've been doing it about 20, 25 years now. A lot of great projects, and I'm just wrapping up season one for stars of a TV show called American Gods, where we have a lot of visual effects. So I hope you guys can take a look at that. And I've had the pleasure for over 15 years working with Cinefax. Um, so I just want to tell you a little bit more about Cinefax for those. How many of you guys have read or have um, seen today a Cinefax magazine? A lot of you guys, so you're really familiar. It's really an in-depth magazine of, of how all this is done and we're transitioning into VR. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of a history um, and then I'm gonna talk about these great panelists here. Um, Cinefex was launched in 1980, believe it or not, with Cinefex number one, issue number one. We covered Star Trek, the motion picture, and Alien. Uh, that's the picture of it. Now, 37 years later, there are 152 issues that have um, basically gone around the world and is uh, currently a big collector's item, which I'm sure you guys have a lot as well and have been featured in it. We have them on our iPads. <laughs> that's there was right. a Kickstarter to get all of them put onto an iPad, mm -hmm. and I was definitely on that. Awesome. So you really have to check it out. And I think we're going to have flyers in the back. And, um, but I want to tell you a little bit about what Cinefax covered, because it's a long history of 37 years. Uh, it was from, the innovation really was when there were optical printers uh, that brought faraway galaxies into the movie house to genetically engineered CGI dinosaurs to 3D comic book series uh, superheroes that basically bound through all the cities of the world. So we've covered everything through the years. And um, right now we are very excited to peer into this new world where we have to put on our headsets to view all this. So um, we're really pleased to sponsor today's panel, um, VFX to VR, how to transition for those that are interested um, in coming from one world to the other. Where I'm gonna start and uh, introduce my distinguished speakers today. On my left is Ben Grossman, the co-founder of Magnapus. Uh, ben is an Oscar-winning and Emmy award-winning visual effects supervisor on feature films, where his virtual production techniques have dovetailed into leadership in VR and AR projects. Through Magnapus's work in virtual and mixed media since 2014, he has contributed to the company's success in an array of next-gen projects in 360 video, including the Proto Award-winning Argus File, the game engine-powered VR experiences on Oculus Rift, HTC Vive, and Gear VR for clients like Disney, Facebook, and NASA. You're gonna see a really cool piece in a minute. Um, right to my left is Aruna Inverson. He is the creative director and visual effects supervisor at Digital Domain of their VR and AR division. Um, Aruna's been at DD for over a decade and in visual effects for over 20 years. And his experience has contributed to many accolades, including two Emmy nominations and a Visual Effects Society nomination for the first virtual reality advertisement, the Neymar Junior Experience for Nike, as well as Bjork's Stone Milker VR Experience, which debuted at MoMA in New York. So really cool stuff. Um, his recent projects include VR experiences based on the pop popular sci-fi series, Welcome to the Quiet Room for Incorporated, and multiple projects based on The Expanse. Currently, he's been developing interactive experiences for a Google Daydream platform using VR stereoscopic video. So these guys know what they're doing. Um, <laughs> down their way at the end, Sam. Hi. Uh, Sam Macaroni is a VR, uh, VR director, writer, and producer. Just flew in from Bulgaria just a few days ago. Woo! Boy, are my <laughs> arms tired. <laughs> <laughs> I had to say it. Uh, prior to founding Thundership, Sam was an executive producer-director at the Walt Disney Company. He's written and directed successful branded 
entertainment campaigns for everything from M&Ms to Windex to AT&T to Canon to Hot Wheels to Pepsi, uh, Disney and the NFL, so lots of projects. Uh, he's written and directed original VR films for Jaunt, Google, Disney, and Daydream as well. As a pioneer in VR, Sam has been teaching virtual reality production workshops for film students at USC, go USC, uh, LMU, and he recently spoke at Sundance as part of the Creative Storytelling and VR panel. So um, I think what we're gonna do, you know, I apologize. I, I had all these pictures and I just realized. <laughs> I didn't even do it, oh no. See, look what a nice picture. Ben looks great. That is pretty slick. Man. Aruna, look, nice photo, Aruna. Sorry, sorry, Sam. I'm really tired. Okay, so we're, oops, hold on. So now we're gonna start with our first uh, intro from, let me make sure. Our first intro uh, from Ben on the project that you just recently did. Sure. Well, yes. First, since we have such an overwhelming crowd today, a quick question. Is this all that's left of the visual effects industry in Los Angeles? <laughs> Are we all here? Is this, raise your hand if you work in VFX right now. Okay, there's like at least nine. <laughs> and then the rest must be spouses or significant others. <laughs> okay, well, um, I, yeah, the, the point of the panel being very focused on helping visual effects artists transition into the world of virtual reality, I think that we've got some cool things to show you today that Bernice has orchestrated for us. And, and one of the first things that, um, that we wanted to throw out was a project that we kind of went through that transition on ourselves. Magnopus is a company that was formed primarily originally from visual effects artists. And then we got into the world of real-time graphics, leveraged all of our background in how to create compelling stories, environments, experiences, and things like that in movies. So swimming through all the complexity of technology and things that don't work into something that just looks pretty and is nice and, and works in the context of something greater. So we, um, we put together this little project, uh, which was actually a side effect of us working on the ambition of putting a 360 VR camera in space. And so we were talking to NASA about that and they wanted to get a better understanding of what that would look like and how that would work. And so we were like, well, we're visual effects people, we'll just pre-visit. And so we were like, hey, we're supposed to be doing VR, we should actually pre-visit not in Maya using a renderer, we should just put it in the game engine. And then we were like, hey, can you give us the models for the space station and we'll just make it all look good and then we'll show it back to you as to what it would look like if you were actually there in 360 video. And then at a certain point we realized, why don't we just release this? This is actually kind of cool. And so the gang at NASA was like, this is fresh. We could get into this. And then uh, Oculus um, fortunately backed us on it. And so we were able to release this, uh, this International Space Station project. And so uh, the trailer will give you a quick overview as soon as Sam's done hamming up for the camera. Bam! <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's it. That was awesome. I didn't touch anything. <laughs> Hold on, I'm going to try again. There were no buttons touched. I think we have a little bit of person on stage combined with person in the back, pressing buttons at the same time. Yeah. And everybody just hold. We're holding, the voiceover will be here momentarily. Only a handful of people know what it's like to be an astronaut. Maybe a little less. To float freely in orbit, unbound by gravity. To work, learn, and live in space. I'm realizing now there's a lot of other VO that we cut out for this video <laughs> that made a lot more sense when it was all in there. <laughs> but Later every this year, uh, you can be one of them. We've already taken a small step. Together, we're going to make a giant. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently making videos is not our thing. Can you complete that sentence? <laughs> so, well, everything that you just saw was, uh, was rendered in a real-time game engine. And it was actually kind of funny because we had a game engine and then we were like, shh, 
shoot, we need to render stuff out of this. And we actually had to like write the, the, um, the parts of the Unreal Engine that would save that out into a nice high quality video. So it was really cool for us to get this in there and it's like you're used to walking through a visual effects company and seeing all these things on people's monitors and going, ooh, that looks good. This looks interesting. There's a couple of buckets of something that will be great someday. And then you start walking through a company where you're like, everything on the monitors always looks great. And then you're like, hey, uh, what are you doing over there? And then they just move the mouse around suddenly and you're like flying through things in real time and you're like, yes. <laughs> 15 years I've been waiting to see something happen that quickly. Instead of like, well, in two weeks, we'll see what this looks like. So yeah, that video, since, since there's a fair amount of visual effects artists, that video took 12 minutes to render <laughs> in 4K, 360 degrees at 60 frames a second. I was so happy about that. And then uh, we, we knocked the quality notch uh, down a notch and, and um, we ended up with a, uh, a real-time experience that operates in subs 11 milliseconds and it can be downloaded now on the Oculus Store. Uh, we originally started it in Unreal Engine, we switched it to Unity. Uh, about halfway through the project because we wanted to make uh, some some better integrations with things that already existed in Unity and still had to be written for Unreal. But either engine was fantastic. The International Space Station looked great in both of them. And uh, for us, the challenge was that we had done a fair amount of work before in 360 video, but 360 video is much closer to visual effects. Like you already, if you are a visual effects artist getting into VR, you will be happy to discover you already know how to pretty much do everything because you've spent your entire career making virtual worlds and the only difference is you're rendering them into a specific point of view, but in VR you have to see them from every angle. So we had done a lot of 360 video and things like that before and we'd done a few game engine powered uh, experiences with reprojections and a lot of other visual effects techniques, but this is one of the first big heavy, okay, we're doing this all in game engine, how do we do it? And so uh, for us the challenge was we weren't a game company we were, we were a lot of people with visual effects experience and we had to figure out how to organize the team in such a way that it made sense because now you have engineers and the people in visual effects who used to be pipeline TDs or you know technical directors in the different departments, comp, lighting, all those kinds of things, suddenly now those engineers are the heart of the operation because they're doing UI UX and they're doing interaction and they're doing like scene optimization and loading geometry in and unloading textures and all these things that become critical when you're really trying to get that, that visual effects grade quality. So I think uh, the thing for us that was interesting was the asset team really is very similar. Well, I, I was going to... I'm just going to sit here and look pretty. <laughs> yeah. so. We have a really great orange chart. He's doing a great job. Go to that or we could do the next video, whichever one you want to do, and then we could go back to the orange chart and talk specifics. Sure, I mean, well, I'm going to... Yeah, go ahead. Well, I, just maybe I'll just talk conceptually about the, okay. the team and then hand off to Arun's connection with more of the live action capture, okay. and then we could do the orange chart, I think. Okay. Um, so we, we handled most of the, like if you're used to the CG department and the comp department and then production kind of overlording everything, we had a little bit of production obviously, but mo for us it was mostly CG department and then engineers. So the assets and everything worked basically the same, same kind of people, modelers, textures, lighters, um, all that stuff was very similar. People had to use how to use a different tool and then they had to learn how to value different things. It wasn't about frame rate or how many hours does that frame take to render. It became about milliseconds of response time and then optimizing the assets to be able to handle that. And, uh, but it was really just about using just generally different software and then adding the engineering layer on top of that to create user interaction. You know? So it really was very similar to a visual effects project except your CG didn't get comped. So it had to look as good as it was gonna look and it had to look that way in real time. Uh, one of the things that we really wanted to do and we haven't been able to do yet, and this is something I wanna point out, when you do work on a movie or a television show, there's a deadline and that deadline is actually dead. Like you will die <laughs> if you go past that deadline. And the cool thing about VR is that it's actually like software development. So we changed the way we were working on movies to be working on software. And so you weren't about these little deadlines for reviews because shots had to be submitted because there were no shots. All you had to do was you'd have sprints and these sprints would be like successive waves of quality that would improve things orchestrated much like a software development company. So we had to learn all that. And then the cool part was that there would be all these things where you're like, ah, shoot, we can't get that done in time for the launch, and the launch has to be launched, and it's not gonna be what we want it to be. And it was like, wait a second, we can do a 1.1 the next week. Yeah. 
and it doesn't even matter. So the cool part, <laughs> the cool part about saying, like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna launch with this, and then we're gonna upgrade that, and we'll do that later. So now I get the opportunity to say one of the things that we are still working on is uh, having volumetric video or live action characters in there, and that's something that I think in in Runa's piece you can talk about a little bit more. Yeah. Um I think last year that was great. I, let it, to hear about what you guys did for ISS is completely awesome. Just to, if you haven't experienced it yet on the Rift, totally do it. Um, it's really great. Uh, our project was a little bit different. Uh, we started this last year uh, for sci-fi. Sci-fi approached us. Um, most of you guys know digital domain, I'm sure. Uh, and mostly we do big high-end visual effects and we have a very small VR AR team. And this project was brought in by sci-fi and they wanted to present something at Comic-Con last year on the Vive. And right away, I wanted to do something that was not 360 video because if you're gonna present something in the Vive, why put a video in there? So we went down this path of trying to figure out something which I've wanted to do for a long time, and that's to put a live action character into a real-time engine, whether it be Unity or Unreal CryEngine, one of these engines. And you know, working with some of the team internally and figuring out some of the methodologies, some of the hard projects and, and pitfalls in doing that, because Unreal and Unity are not meant to take in streams of video files at all. And so we had to do a lot of R&D and development to make this thing work. Uh, in, in addition to that, we had a huge amount of set prep and, and laser scanning and stereography and, and, and just rotomation. Um, and I think this video, which I talk over, uh, will help give you a two minute kind of overview of what we did. So surprised. Sci-Fi's The Quiet Room Experience for the television show Incorporated was a real-time virtual reality project which combined the novel approach of pre-recording multiple actors with a stereoscopic camera system and placing them into a real-time environment. And the company provides a life of comfort and security in the green zone. These actors were scanned in real time with a high-speed revolving laser scanning system. Protection against the chaos and starvation outside. And using that data combined with the stereo disparity from two cameras, we were able to place our characters in their appropriate position in VR space. Using an approximate digital model, we were able to line up our main actor's performance in 3D. This model accurately portrayed his physical location in 3D space. By then shrink wrapping our pre-recorded performances over this depth data, we were able to give the viewer the freedom of movement around this pre-recorded moment in time. chaos and starvation outside. The VR experience plays back at 90 frames per second, allowing an unparalleled narrative story to be told the way VR is meant to be viewed, in stereo, with positional tracking, and rendered in real time. That was the best Allstate commercial I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, yeah, so, um, <laughs> so we, we, we premiered that at Comic-Con last year um, at the Hard Rock Cafe. Sci-Fi set up their entire Hard Rock Cafe in the theme of Incorporated as corporations take over the world. And of course, the Allstate guy is our protagonist in that, in that um, <laughs> TV series. Uh, and it is, it is played real time uh, through the Vive off of actually a laptop that the sci-fi guys had uh, with binaural audio, uh, positional tracking as well. The really great thing about this project is that we were able to use a lot of our existing VFX pipeline and methodology, green screen pulls, paint tracking, everything you, you would usually do on a feature film, except comp wasn't the end of the line anymore. Now we had to feed that through our game engine pipeline that we were still developing and figuring out ways to make streams of video like this. This thing plays for three minutes long and there's two streams of video. And then you have to incorporate alpha channels and Z buffers into this, these video streams that Unreal can't usually decode. So we had to write a bunch of new tools and techniques to get this thing to work. And what you see here is a straight pull 
off of the game engine render. So we're able to actually be able to record this thing. And if you go on Facebook, you can see the full unwrapped thing and look around. But it's not the same as the positional tracking and looking around Dennis Haysbert as, as he's walking around you, which is something amazing that we were able to do with live action film plate photography. So I think it's. Uh, it's I think that's cool. a good transition actually for yeah. Sam because you're in so much live action production. The team that you have to teach and all your tricks. We thought we could talk a little bit about that and then we'll go back to the <laughs> So <laughs> let me just say for a second though, <laughs> Sam is a live action production guy. You notice how far he separated himself from <laughs> yeah. the visual effects people? No, I just, just didn't want uh, you know, this side looking so <laughs> empty. And, you know, so it didn't look like we were such an empty panel because there's a lot of big brains up here. So um, these guys are way smarter than me. <laughs> I'm a director and I do live action, um, a lot of action pieces and some documentary type pieces. And I did live action features uh, prior. And it was interesting taking some of my team members that I worked with for a long time uh, and porting them over to this new world. So um, the first were my stunt guys. Uh, these guys have been in tons of movies and they're used to the way you shoot a feature film, which is you come in and you do your wides and your mediums and your closes and that's what they're used to. So for VR, I would bring them in and I would choreograph essentially a giant stage play that took place um, for two minutes. And um, first thing is we'd shoot the action sequence and everyone would say, great, now let's do my medium. I can do that better. And I said, no, go home, we're done because it's a wonder. And everybody's so confused by that. Um, the other thing that was interesting is I did this big action scene and, and a guy gets shot off of a, uh, a roof and he does his fall and another guy gets shot and he does his fall. And uh, they're so used to shooting that in sections. But it's two minutes, it plays out. So I said, when you die, you stay down till we call cut. And nobody understood that. So. You know, for the first take, they'd be up and they'd be breathing and, and watching the other people. And I'm like, dude, we can see you. We can see everything, like, you know? <laughs> so you go back and you shoot it where the guy's just laying there and the Lamborghini rips past him and he's like, you better not hit me, dude. And <laughs> they're not used to working like that. So it's really cool in an interesting way. Like, the traditional framed media people have a hard time wrapping their head around the fact that it sees everything, you know? And, and maybe the action's happening here, but somebody can wander their gaze over here and they might see you breathing, so you really have to play it dead. So that's cool and it's interesting and it's fun. Um, another thing that I find so funny is when people first do VR, they think, as a director, that you have to run around the corner and hide um, when we shoot. Uh, and we don't have to. I can stand right behind the camera, I can direct, and then I just shoot a clean plate and I erase myself later, and that blows people's minds. Um, so it's a, it's a lot like regular framed media. Uh, I, so I, I have my mind blown by a director who erases himself. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I take myself out. Sometimes I'll like leave myself for one frame and that's my Hitchcock moment, but uh, I... I I, when I worked with the Odyssey, the, the jump camera, the Google camera, it has no top camera and no bottom camera. And I think they're fixing that right now because it's kind of silly. But the stereo is amazing. But uh, they gave me the pamphlet and it was like, uh, how to direct VR. And in there, it's like, where does the director stand? And, and they had a diagram of the director crouched under the tripod <laughs> because the camera couldn't see you. And I just like a picture of a little guy. And I'm like, guys, come on. Like, this is gonna be hilarious in a hundred years. They're gonna be like, really, Google? <laughs> like, that's what you came up with? So I thought that was, you know, it's just like the world's, you know, it's, it's interesting to try and transition all these little things. And another thing that I've done is um, I've used miniatures. I have a scene in something that I'm shooting right now, an action sequence, where a sinkhole opens up. And we tried a CG sinkhole, and it looked like a CG sinkhole, because we're not as good as these guys, and we don't, can't afford digital domain. So we, we built out a tabletop model, and it was you know 12 feet big, and, and I had a guy make a sinkhole. He pulls these cords, and it rips down, and the sand goes down. And we shot it with a red, um, and I shot the action piece with the Nozo. And since we're 40 feet up in the air at this time on a drone, looking down, the ground's just kind of a flat plane. We were able to just graft that over and actually put that miniature uh, shot into it. And I was so stoked. I felt so 80s, because those are all the movies that I love. Um, so I love trying to use practical effects. I love taking a guy, a stunt guy, on a wire and blasting him through a wall uh, real time, and then just erasing the wire. All that stuff works in 360. It's a little more difficult with stereoscopic, because you have a over-under image. And 
if you erase the wire in the wrong place and you erase this wire in the wrong place, it actually sticks out more that there was something there. So it's a little bit of math, but um, you can use all the same tricks. And everybody says, oh, that's not, you can't do that in VR because of the rules. There are no rules because this is so brand new that you know everybody's a pioneer in these first couple of years. So I always tell people, just try everything. Shoot it once so you know you have it right, and then try your crazy idea, because it might work, and then 10 people will copy you and do it better, and that's how things progress. So I'm pretty excited, you know? I'm pretty excited, because I get to be like Charlie Chaplin. Like, we're figuring out how to do this stuff right now, you know, and 100 years from now. I just want that one shot, the macaroni shot. It's like the, the Orson Welles will, has a shot, you It'll know? be a director under a tripod. Yeah, that, <laughs> <laughs> action! Huddle over there, there's looking no, at the budget. Yeah, there's no room for my megaphone to stick out, you know, or my pontoon <laughs> pants, you know? So yeah, it's, it's interesting, but it's funny because nobody understands it yet, and that's because there's nothing to understand. We're still figuring it out. And also teaching the actors how close they can be to the cameras, right? That's another thing. Yeah. Where they look in and they, you know, they want to look into the world, but it's like you can't yeah. come to so many Well, feet, it was so. so funny because VR year one was always uh, like uh, what filmed, you know, uh, live action is a camera on a tripod and all these bad actors talking to it like it's you or you're a hostage and you're stuck in a chair, you know, and like they, that was as creative as they could get. And I also saw one where you're lying down. And I think you're being buried in a coffin and the intro title said uh, best if viewed while laying down. And I'm like, and there's other ones, the best of viewed in a swivel chair. And I'm just like, you can't tell your audience how to watch here. Like, what if they're at a bus stop and they're on this magic window? Like, you, so you got to make content that works for everybody everywhere. Um, and I think that's so silly. So year two, it's getting a little cool, uh, cooler. And I think year three, four, and five, it's going to get really awesome. So to kind of go back, we just have a few minutes left. Let's, should we uh, transition back to? Org chart. <laughs> we're our chart. We work so hard. Well, I mean, Ben works so hard on it. But Should I, we? okay. Well, well, I'm gonna apologize right out of the gate because I, uh, I thought that there was a separate slide with a Runes org chart in it, and so this one doesn't incorporate everybody. So I'm gonna pantomime okay. the missing pieces from the live action. Sure. Component, let's let's do that. Which many people? How many people in the audience in the visual effects department are uh, in compositing? All right. Two. Three. Two. Three. Three. Yeah. And everyone else is CG, huh? Cool. All right. Well, <clears throat> I, I thought that it, th so there's an imagine on the right side that there's an imaginary column there Sorry. that could, no, it's okay. It's my bad. I misread the emails. <laughs> imagine on the right side there's a column that has uh, paint and roto and comp and stereo conversion and then all the ad, uh, relevant administrative layers. I just thought it would be interesting to look at this chart and say, okay, we know the art director, we know the CG supervisor, but now there's this person who is the lead software engineer. And so you can look at these sort of three columns of people and I'll translate them from the visual effects equivalent to what we thought worked relatively well for virtual reality. Um, in the art department, you now have UI designers, in addition to graphic designers. So a UI designer would work on in-game menus and the UX workflow of what happens when a user gets to this door? Like what button do they press? How does the door open? Uh, can they pull themselves from this way to that way? Like what kind of interactions do they need to confirm? Are you sure you wish to leave the space station? Are you sure you'd like to uh, engage the controls to dock the SpaceX capsule? So you have these UI designers and you have graphic designers because obviously you have a lot of graphics that need to be created. Um, you know, menus and tutorials and how do things work and patches and all that kind of stuff to make environments look real. Concept artists um, and even the art director's job was to sort of say, this is the aesthetic that we'd like for the entire environment. You know, Rune had to do that in his piece and everybody has to say, this is the vision, this is what things should look like. And, and actually that, the art director there, Alex Nice, um, is fantastic now at, he, you know, he was a visual effects artist for you know, a decade or so. And then when he got into VR, he's like, oh my God, I'm only working in VR from now on. So now he is in Louisiana doing a movie as an art director. But what he's done is he builds all of his art direction in VR and then he puts the director in VR to review the artwork and then he puts the special effects crew in it and he puts the construction department in it. And so all these people, he's got general contractors who have to build movie sets, putting on a VR headset and looking at his art direction and then saying, okay, well, can you just export this to Rhino so I can actually you know, model out the blueprints and everything. So, so that, that whole approach there, very traditional, but now being adapted into VR. Um, we had an N animator because there were some things that need to be animated from time to time. But then in, in, the, uh, in the CG team, 
you know, a fair amount of these people are visual effects veterans. And, and we sort of broke them into a very traditional flow of, all right, uh, model out assets, and then those are too heavy to run, so now optimize those assets and make them able to run at frame rate. And then structure the way that those assets are organized and loaded so that the game engine can pull them in and push them out magically when the audience can't see them. And then uh, 2D artists, which normally in visual effects we would put into this category, made more sense in the in, in the asset category because they were responsible for creating much of the environment work. So whether it was texturing or whether it was matte paintings of earth and things like that, um, we had we had definitely, definitely some visual effects grade uh, 2D artists. And then they had, they had to learn how to, basically how it would load, right? So much different from yeah. how heavy it was in effects. Now it's like, how does it load? What kind of card is it? That sort of thing, I think, was one of the biggest challenges I had when I was doing a project, that they had to have really a basic from the team to learn that. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the org chart really, I mean, it does take some adaption, and I don't think that we don't, I don't think that we really even have the titles right because there are some people on this org chart right now who actually came from the games industry and they always roll their eyes whenever I say what a person's title is and they always roll their eyes whenever I say we need to hire a, mm, they always just go, oh, uh, that doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, well that's because it's half of what I know and half of what you know and that's because it's a new thing. So we have to figure out what all these titles actually are but um, yeah, and this is all in addition to all the traditional VFX roles that we had on, on VR Incorporated. Uh, the, you know, some of these things can be moved back and forth. A lot of the asset development people that make objects and textures and matte painting can work both in the real time and in the VFX world, and that's a very easy switch for everyone. Um, but then there's the, the pure engineers, the pure programmers, the ones that know Unity and Unreal that are usually specific to that, and that's where we hire from, you know, Gamma Sutra and game companies. Um, that's where we're trying to go. I mean, yeah. that, that's a huge part of, of what we want to try to do um, to get into more of that real time, and you need to, to have those, those yeah. skills. Yeah, it's definitely a handful. Like, I've oversimplified drastically the production of this because in visual effects, you know, the producers and the coordinators and the render wranglers and all that kind of stuff, that, that quality assurance tab right there, mm -hmm. that was three companies working around the clock with, like, sometimes 20 to 30 people. When we, when we did QA, it was like... You know, in visual effects, you're like, ah, no one's going to see that. It's in the corner. We're going to color correct it. We'll fix that in the grade. But in QA, they're like, no, 600 people are going to hit that bug, and then they're going to complain and file a bug report. So we had all these companies doing quality assurance. And fortunately, I mean, because we were so freaked out by the fact that people were going to be inside our movie, we spent a lot of time bug fixing. But QA is a pretty serious thing in VR because people can have a bad trip if your frame rate's bad or people yeah. can you know get really angry on Reddit if your <laughs> shit crashes all the time and so I, you have a headset you're definitely on the internet yeah. and you're ready yeah. to be angry yeah exactly like we launched it and then and then that guy right there the VR tech supervisor because he's the guy who's like we need to be using this SDK or here's this new piece of tech like he's the person who stays on top of all this stuff because like we would start writing stuff like hands we had a whole hands and arms rigging system that worked and then we were like isn't somebody else doing this? Why are we doing this? And then Oculus is like, oh yeah, I think we have a team of people working on that. And I was like, well, should we be using that instead? Because we just wrote this one and now we have to finish it, but shouldn't we, can't we? So you have to stay on top of the fact that the tech changes constantly. It's not like Maya, where you're like, are you guys using 2016 yet? It's like, because you know, in visual effects, we're always using two years behind the current version, because in a movie or a TV show, you'd never really have the luxury or the money to get the current version, and it takes the, it takes the pipeline department at least a year to QA a year's build. So anyways, yeah, in VR, you have, to, you have to stay on top of that stuff, because then what would happen is that they would push an update to something, and you'd be like, ah, everything broke, we have to fix it. So it was, um, yeah. It was actually super fun, though. The satisfaction of seeing things happen in real time when they do start getting real time is pretty gratifying. But, um, but yeah, it was an even mix of people. I think we had a little bit of game people. We had a little bit of visual effects people. And, and the production people had to figure out how to work in a software development model as opposed to a, let's go to the screening room and look at our shots. Yeah. It's like and the terminology changed as well so much. Right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. The worst thing is when you go to a meeting and you try and show like six studio execs your movie, 
because it's one headset. So you have to play it for one, and then everyone makes fun of him and takes pictures. Yeah. You play it for the next, and then by the time we get to the last guy, you're just trying to make conversation with the first three, and it's just like, they need to make a headset that just push a button, and 10 people see the same thing we're, at once. We're doing actually something now, and, and it'll be easier in the future when there's more headsets propagated, but in visual effects, we were talking to, um, and I won't say who they all are because we don't know if they're actually gonna do it all yet, but we were talking to people who write visual effects collaboration software for visual effects companies to collaborate you know, around the world on big projects. And we were like, you should be using VR even for the visual effects movies because the days, like when I was a visual effects artist, I started in wire removal and paint. And I did it at a time when movies were all film and we filmed them out. So my film outs would get looked at in the screening room and I would sit next to the director of the movie to review my wire removals. <laughs> That's how serious visual effects were back in the day. Now it's always like, what, wire removals? Do those even get, those, do those get done by editorial now? Who handles that? Like, I don't know. But when was the last time you sat next to the director of a movie who has won an Oscar <laughs> so that you can both be like, how's that wire removal look? <laughs> you're like, it doesn't happen anymore. But it was so serious back then on Master and Commander or whenever, Spider-Man, whatever I did it. And, and the thing now is that in VR, you can be sitting next to the director reviewing your work, even if the director is like in Hollywood and you're in you know, India or in London or Vancouver or wherever. A virtual reality review system for, for people's shots and a virtual reality front end applications like Maya or Nuke. Like, who doesn't want to walk around inside your shot and sort of be like, oh, now I see why this doesn't work or now I see why that, that isn't quite tracking right. I think VR is a tool in visual effects can kind of bring both up together. Just even the performance would be awesome. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting uh, quite, you know thing you have there. We were doing something for a big company that shall remain nameless, but we had uh, an interactive session with them, with all the CDs in a room, and we were building an environment. And so we had an, a, a, a Unity operator that was just building assets right there, and we could see it was broadcast on the screen. They could put on the Vive and walk around the room and place furniture, really. Place furniture, move furniture, scale furniture, draw on the wall, whatever they wanted. And then what would happen is that that gets baked out and it gets brought back to the V-Ray rendering team. And then they render it out. And within 30 minutes, they have a really, really nice render of what they just interactively changed. So we're able to give them something that they interactively placed and then it went back and they rendered it. And then it changed another six times. And you'll be able to take all the studio executives put them in VR at the same time, and then if one of them wanders off, maybe they get hit by a bus in virtual yeah. reality or something like or, that. Or, I don't even have to show up. I yeah. just do my whole presentation in VR, just send them a letter, put this on. Right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sam my Macaroni, stuff. and I have no pants. I have, and I have no pants. <laughs> is, this, is this countdown include the questions, or? Yeah, we're Oh, we have yeah. bonus time for questions? Yeah. Well, uh, something that people don't realize in the framed media world is um, that since the camera does see everything, all my friends say, well, let's put it on a steady cam," And then I'm like, but you'll see the guy like huffing and puffing and pushing it. It works, though. Yeah. It, AJ Raitano is a steady cam operator yeah. sometimes. He's a great second. AJ is fantastic. He, he was, does a lot of work with New Deal Studios. He did Matthew Gratzner's... The, mission, pirate the mission yeah, and the pirate thing, the pirate but thing, I think yeah. he did it. He did a with fair a amount of work cam. with that in a steady cam. And then I forget his name, Jeff Jaspers at New Deal Studios. Uh, I forget what tool he used, and he painted him out. Yeah, oh yeah, you have to paint. Phenomenally. Yeah, oh yeah, it's a lot of paint. You have to paint. That's the <laughs> problem. <laughs> you gotta have a guy to put that back in there. Yeah, and they're like, put him in a green screen sock. And I'm like, yeah. First of all, no steady cam guy wants to wear that. And second of all, you still have to have the information that's back there. So it's, I, I know in like uh, five years, kids on YouTube will just be killing it. You know, it's like 12 year olds will be able to do this stuff with software. But right now, it's still all yeah. being figured once, out. Once we get volumetric capture going on, yep. it'll be a little bit easier to just say, do we have coverage for all this oh, stuff? Is yeah. it clean? And then reprojecting and filling Boom. seams and all that kind of stuff will be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Look, we did that, and we still have 40 seconds. We're good. <laughs> Bam, so, nailed it. So we have about 10 minutes, so we thought we would take some questions from the audience. Does anyone have any questions for these fabulous men on anything? And if you don't have any questions, you're severely uh, underestimating how difficult it is to make the transition from visual effects <laughs> to VR. Yeah, I, <laughs> you, sir. I'm actually uh, working production for visual effects and animation and whatnot, and I was wondering if you guys had any suggestions for breaking in from a production standpoint. When you say production, do you mean like producer, coordinator, production management? Yes. Production management. Br Br well, yeah, yes. 
actually. I can tell you quite a bit about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, for our project, we had all the traditional VFX uh, production people, coordinators, producers, and they helped wrangle that, all the data into the real-time engine. And on, on top of that, there's another kind of coordinator for all that stuff, too, to make sure that everything that re is received from the VFX side, the plates, the finished plates, the assets, gets tracked into real time. But from the perspective of project management, mm -hmm. how did you work? Did you work like a traditional visual effects house, or did you work in agile development? We made it up. Ah. <laughs> I mean, we're all making it up as we see, go along. See that I mean, lead software engineer? Yeah. He doesn't let me make things up. Yeah. So uh, when you start dealing with software engineers, in that world, which is, I gotta be honest with you, very heavily driving VR right now. When you see really big badass stuff like Robo Recall and whatnot, where you're just like, whoa, this is, shit's complicated, and the management of that is complicated. What we're discovering is that agile development methodologies, Sprint, Scrum, that kind of stuff, are the way that software developers like to work. And so we at Magnopus, in the first two or three years, it took us a while to get our art department teams from visual effects into this uh, sprint cycle mentality. So in visual effects, you're like, I gotta get this in dailies tomorrow, I gotta get this in dailies tomorrow, I gotta get this in dailies tomorrow. In software development, you're like, there's no tomorrow, it's gonna take me four days just to get blah, 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 blah. So you work in sprints and everybody picks off user stories and they say, okay, in this sprint I will accomplish this. And then there are, there are scrum masters who say, okay, we have these feature requests in the backlog, we're gonna put these things into this sprint. And then you're constantly iterating on what you've done. As a producer and coordinator, our producers and coordinators at Magnopus were visual effects people, and they struggled at first, hardcore, to figure that out. And then finally, uh, they became Scrum certified, with project management professionals and all that kind of stuff. And that changed everything for how they could manage this kind of team. And our art people got into that, because that's how most software development works, and it makes so much more sense. Because then you have like a, you can get into this mindset of we are constantly shipping a product. Like at any point, the client could just call us and say, that's it, time's up, ship it. And you have a product that's as good as it can be, rather than, ooh, we just took the engine out of the car. Hang on one second, let me find the wheels, you know? So, so I would say from a production standpoint, you're getting into agile development and sprint, scrum, methodologies, and then you can start getting really deep from there, but it's definitely start there. Sure. Holler it out. Ooh, I can tell you that right now, no, in a month and a half, a movie will be starting to be shot completely in the VR editor for theatrical release. So right now I see multiple people in a VR editor collaborating and creating, and that would represent in the traditional film processes, a uh, cinematographer, um, production designer, props, greensman, uh, set deck, and um, all those people logged into a shared common VR space uh, designing a movie and then shooting it. Yes. So yes, I do see a world where that happens today. Yeah, it's cool. I have the mic over here, sorry. Um, I, you mentioned Unreal Six. and Unity, and I was just wondering, hi. Um, I, <laughs> I was just wondering if there were any other new tools or techniques um, that you thought were good to mention for people that are learning and should look at the new tools other than the ones you mentioned already. Beyond Unreal and Unity? Yeah. Oh and my God. maybe not. Yeah, I mean look, <laughs> no, there's metric fuck tons of them. So, I keep forgetting I'm holding We are in the Unreal an Theater, maybe so, so my apologies. Top five. Cinefex did not endorse any of this. Um, <laughs> Yeah, beep. So, uh, I mean, look, substance designer is awesome. Um, one of the things that you do in visual effects is you try to create assets and usually use Maya and usually a visual effects studio has their own pipeline. But uh, in the game engine world, you're trying to create highly optimized assets that go from looking really great to performing really well. And that's not something that visual effects software normally does out of the box. And so there's a couple of tools in the games industry um, 
and I'll just throw one of them out as an example, Substance uh, is, is really oriented around that. And one of the cool things about creating your assets in that package, and I'm not shilling it for anyone, but one of the cool things is that, is that later on if you decide, oh, we wanted to go to Unreal instead of Unity, or we need to do an export to visual effects for something else, you have a little bit more flexibility there because you didn't build it in the engine. Now, when you get to the engine, you might want to wish that you had done more of it in the engine because obviously if you're working in the engine, you're a little bit more optimized and you can get a little bit, you can squeeze a little bit more quality out of what you're doing by doing it in the engine. But if you need flexibility more than anything else, working in a third party application to create the assets, then just move them into that. But in all reality, I think we all have the advantage on this stage of seeing down the road a little bit more because we're using the alphas and betas of most of the software from the visual effects industry and from the VR industry. I can tell you that you are very quickly coming to a future where the content creation tools that you're using for virtual or for visual effects are going to be a button click into VR and back again. because to do that whole thing that this gentleman over here was asking about, you have to be able to round trip and have parity from things like Maya, Max, Moto, Katana, whatever it is, into a real-time game engine and then modified in a game engine and then back into that pipeline. So, yeah, those are, there's, but I would try something like that. But both of the engines, you know, like I said, both of those two engines that we mentioned, and there's certainly other ones too, Crytek's fantastic engine, but um, those two, it's like Unreal Engine, artists get into really quickly because it works a lot like Houdini with Blueprint and it lets them program and do a lot of cool stuff and it looks great out of the box and there's lots of great stuff that an artist in visual effects can do and Unity has a little bit more programmatic capability. So if you really want to build an enterprise grade crazy thing, it's a little bit cleaner and faster there, but both of them are constantly you know, one-upping each other, which is a great level of competition. Yeah, we have some more questions over there. We we got at least three minutes. Yeah, we got uh, almost three minutes. I uh, got a question about the International Space Station project. So when you first received the digital asset from NASA, I would imagine it was a very high polygon count. Um, no, asset. no, those those guys just wing it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm just curious about the journey that you had to go through to go through the uh, you know the polygon reduction to get into you know um, Unity and render at decent frame rates. And what is that trade-off in terms of quality versus speed? I am so glad you asked that question because it reinforces that we made a good decision to actually write an entire 40-page PDF answering exactly that question. And I just approved it on Friday. So as soon as the graphic designer finishes like cleaning up some typos, we're gonna release that on the internet so you can actually follow the entire process, which starts out with the, when we got the CAD files from NASA, they were way, way, way too heavy. And then ends up with, in retrospect, we probably should have done this instead of that. Uh, so yes, it was a, a fair amount of work, and really there's a lot of quirks about the engines that I don't want to uh, drill into too much, but Unreal does it a certain way, Unity does it a certain way, and when you really want to squeeze that last 5-10% of quality out of a particular deliverable, you got to know the engine really well, and you got to know how it handles uh, draw calls, geometry loads, level loads, and we had to break the space station up into certain things, so like if you want to go outside, we had to make it so there was a level load so that you say, do you want to go outside? Yes, fade to black and dump all the geometry and reload new geometry and fade up your outside. We could just do open world stuff, but you really have to optimize your assets for certain things. So there's a lot, that is right there, the heart of virtual reality compared to visual effects. Because in visual effects, you're just like, shit, this is on the farm. It's gonna take like four <laughs> hours of frame. I'm gonna go play ping pong, I'll be back later. There's no four hours of frame in VR. It's like it's playing or it's not playing, and, and that's that. So, so all of your artists, the visual effects who hide behind these render times, like, what are you talking about? It's like fur and water. Of course it's gonna take a while. It's like, no. In VR, there's no more excuses. You're, you're called out on the dance floor right away. It's like you are taking 15 milliseconds to do something that should be four back to the workstation. So it's hard. That's the secret sauce. Anybody else? Right there, young lady. You can just yell. Okay, you can yell into the microphone. <laughs> I need a speaker. Um, since you asked about how many people work in uh, compositing, so um, I, you know, be honest, in the near future, probably there's very little need for compositing. So um, is there any thing that you think in your mind that the skill can be transferred into VR? Um, 
what kind of skill will be useful? Well, and how? I, I think I think for for my projects, a lot of a lot of the cinematic stuff that we're doing in, in VR, we still need compers. I mean, we're finishing up a project right now uh, that's on Daydream, uh, and we're just finishing up our millionth frame, and that's that's a lot of frames. Yeah, uh, and we're 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 rendering out fifty thousand frames every week for episodic relief, release. So, I mean, so we have a good comp team. I mean, our team is going crazy on that. And, and so I think it's to get that QC, the, 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 you know, we're, we're no longer the middle, we're the end of the line anymore. We're now in the middle. You know, well, so we have to deliver it out to the real-time yeah. engine, and we have to optimize everything that we do, alphas, comps, depths, everything, uh, to make it work. So I don't think we're going to see compers go away anytime soon, especially for cinematic stuff. I mean, then we have volumetric capture coming in, and that's going to be another kind of like... It does become a little bit more of a technical job, yeah, and yeah. the artistry of combining multiple random disparate things, like, oh, I got a picture from the internet, and a map painting from the art department, and I got you know, this footage that was green screen and keyed. I mean, just to put it in context, I, I was a compositor most of my career, and now I'm not. Now I'm totally worthless in that org chart. <laughs> so, so as a compositor, ironically, your job, if you're a compositor, has been to take things that don't fit together and make them fit together. And the good news is that's building a company, making a project, putting a team together, designing what the space station should look like in front of the Earth. Like all of those skills that you have as a compositor, now you just put your hands in your pockets and you tell other people how to do those things in real time. And my background is a compositor as well. So I mean, yeah. We're, we're both worthless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, on that end, uh, we're going to, unfortunately, we're run out of time, but thank you so much. And Cinefix was very honored to have this distinguished panel here. Woo! Thank and, you, uh, Cinefix! Woo! Thank you so much. And just keep remembering that Cinefix is going to transition more into VR uh, projects, and these guys will probably be in those articles. So we hope that you check it out, subscribe, and check out the iPad as well. Thanks for your time. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.